Okay, so it's nice to see everyone is enjoying uh, Sao Paulo as much as I am, particularly the people who aren't here, enjoying it too much, um, maybe. Okay, so um, it's nice to see everyone back again. Um, I'm going to stand here like Martin did because I think doing this dance around here is not so effective and it hurts, strains the neck to see this. Um, so what uh, today I wanted to build a bit, little bit on yesterday. So yesterday I was obviously very biased and I was only talking about particle acceleration at primarily at non-relativistic shocks. And of course that's only a very small subset of, um, of, of mechanisms by which we can produce non-thermal particles. Um, in astrophysical systems, um, and so I'm going to uh, briefly mention just a handful of others. Um, shocks will appear again, um, and then I want to make the connection to radiation. Um, and what I want to do is give a, uh, let's say, a slightly intuitive, what I think is an intuitive introduction to uh, the key relativistic uh, emission processes, particularly for electrons, um, which avoid a lot of the rather ugly mathematics um, that's very often used in, in, in electromagnetism. Okay. okay, so quick outline of what I'm going to discuss today. Um, so some alternative mechanisms for um, acceleration, um, then a unified picture of non-thermal electron emission, um, and then really giving you some simple tools for people who wanted to develop this. I mean, nowadays there are many uh, open source packages for doing non-thermal emission models, um, single zone models, um, but it's, it's nice to be able to do back of the envelope uh, uh, calculations to really get a feel for what's happening physically. Um, and then I'll finish off with, with just a handful of examples, um, which I think are interesting and timely. Okay. okay, so here's a selection of um, alternative acceleration schemes um, that are uh, commonly, uh, you might come across in the literature. Um, so I'll just go through them one by one. Um, they get um, a little bit more exotic as you move down. Um, so we start off with uh, a very old process. This is magnetic reconnection. Now, magnetic reconnection is a, uh, a fairly well-established physical process. It's an, it's an essential process. Um, it determines uh, a large part of the, the dissipation of energy in many astrophysical environments, and particularly our sun. It creates the coronal mass ejections that we see, possibly maybe the reason why the chromosphere is so hot um, in, our, in our, uh, our sun, and then probably plays a similar role in, in many, other, uh, many other stars. Um, the basic idea was first introduced in the, 19, in the 40s and 50s, um, more or less as, as a concept, um, and then the mathematics or the physical model was developed slightly later by, by Sweet and by Parker, um, and then also by uh, Pechek. Um, and Firth. Okay. The idea is very simple. Right. You have uh, some region where you have the field is um, effectively changing directions. Yeah, so a field going this way and a field going this way. And the idea is that somehow uh, there is a diffusion region in here. So uh, recall from your Maxwell's equations, J, if we ignore uh, displacement current, J is equal to the curl of B. So I've clearly got a magnetic field going this way and a magnetic field going this way and a gradient this way. So I clearly have a curl and therefore I must have a current going in here, so we call this a current sheet. So the sheet is going out of the plane. Okay, so if fields can be brought in here and then you break, basically your ideal MHD will tell you, this was all this E equals minus U cross B. If you can drag these fields into this small region here, um, then you can in principle have some sort of diffusion. Um, these field lines reconnect um, and then you can create uh, these outflows. So you reconnect the fields and then they, they get spread out here. So you see th these field lines are curved and so they'll move out um, at a certain velocity. Now the efficiency of the process is basically determined by how quickly can you get stuff in here, right? Because the material is tied to the fields, so how quickly can you get into this diffusion region? Okay, so here's what the Sweet Parker picture said. Well, you diffuse in by uh, an E cross B drift, okay, um, and so this is the magnetic field is going in the x direction, and so the electric field then has to be going in the, in the z direction. Okay. Um, we're in this diffusion region here, so we have some resistivity, this eta here, um, and so that then we can connect uh, to this, this quantity here, uh, which or rather is just the curl of the, of, of the magnetic field, so curl B, um, and then delta is the width of this region here. And so mass conservation will tell you 
that the flux into this diffusion region must equal the flux out of this diffusion region if it's not completely compressed. Um, and energy conservation, we basically say everything coming in is magnetic, everything coming out is kinetic. So that's this equation here. Um, and then you can play around with these, just these equations. It's very straightforward. What you find is that this tells you the, out, the outflow speed is the alphane speed. Um, and then, so the velocity in over velocity out is just the in over the alphane velocity. And this is the ratio of this to this, which in principle is a very, very small number. Okay, and so you can combine those and show that the inflow velocity is basically the alphane velocity divided by the magnetic valence number, which is a very large number, right? In astrophysical plasmas, this is 10 to the 20, something like this. Okay, so it's very, very slow um, and it's very ineffective, uh, but this is just the theory. Um, in reality, when you do simulations, this is, uh, turns out to be quite fast, okay? Um, and that's because there's additional physics that's included, uh, that's not included here, that determines what's happening in the shear layer. We see that you can break it up into lots of little islands, so these diffusion regions start to become of comparable size. This is not such a, ugh, this is not such a small number, and the process can become quite fast. Um, the issue that I always have, let's say in terms of connecting to high energy astrophysics, is that all of this is happening down at really small kinetic scales. It's not um, these are not going to be on the scale where you're really seeing interactions here with, with PV particles, okay? Um, <clears throat> despite what some people may claim. But there is another interest, very interesting effect. If the flow is always coming in here, always going in this direction, the electric field, there's a constant out of plane electric field, okay? And so if a particle now is energetic enough, and again, this is always this issue of if it's energetic enough, in principle, it can sample just by its gyro motion, it can cross over this current sheet, and it does what are called spicer orbits. And so what spicer orbits does is that if you think of a particle moving out of the plane here, it rotates in one sense this side of the, this plane, and then on the other side it goes this way. So if I were to turn this figure sideways, I would see these particles doing what are called spicer orbits. And while they're doing these spicer orbits, they see a constant electric field. So they just accelerate all the way up to the size of the current sheet. Okay? And this, in principle, can get you up to quite high energies. And I think this is probably a major factor in uh, acceleration of, of very high energy particles in, in the Crab Nebula, for example, um, that Alicia was, was talking about yesterday. Okay. Ah. Okay, so that's my kind of reconnection done for now. Um, so another possibility is shear flows. Now this is um, an interesting process because it is unavoidable in extragalactic sources. Okay? Um, we know that AGN produce jets, yeah? or also gamma ray bursts produce jets. Uh, we know they're collimated, and therefore the velocity in here must be larger than the velocity out here. This is effectively at rest. This can be moving with a fairly large Lorentz factor. Um, okay, so we can break this down to a very simple toy model. So here is the jet, the jet's moving with some Lorentz factor um, to the right, um, and this is stationary. And so we can play the game that we, we always played, again, with shock acceleration, that if a particle goes in here, its energy is conserved in the local frame, does whatever it does, gets scattered, and it comes back out, okay? And you can work out what was the change in energy, and it depends on the difference between these two angles. So if it goes in against the jet and comes out with the jet, clearly it's exactly like a shock. It got head-on collision. But if it went in against the jet and came out, oh, if it went in with the jet and came out against the jet, that's like an overtaking collision. So it loses energy. So this is a, a second-order process. But um, it can be very, very effective at relativistic shocks. In fact, if you go in... Uh, go in against the jet or even at any uh, uh, positive value of this, um, if you come out very close to the jet, the energy gain can be quite substantial, okay, of order gamma squared. Um, so it's just playing around with these numbers and setting this number roughly equal to one. Um, these energy gains, though, are, are, tend to be quite rare and you have to compete with another of, number of effects, in particular, the fact that, again, this is always this issue of getting energetic enough this here toy model is, assumes an infinitely thin shear layer, and in reality, you probably have quite a complex um, 
sheath forming along the jet interface. Okay, um, and so in general, this type scenario can produce very hard spectra. Um, in reality, when you take into account all the details, the spectra seem to be a bit more modest um, and reasonably consistent with with, the pic uh, with, with, with observations um, of some jets. Um, and here's just a little toy Monte Carlo code where you can see what happens, acceleration happen process. So I inject at the base of the jet, particles, these little worms, um, start crossing in and outside of the jet, and eventually they get up to very high energies, which they tend to do quite far up, okay? yeah, which, is, which is another interesting effect. Okay. Um, one thing that this is, plays a critical role, and I'm not gonna mention this again, because I, I didn't really have time, is that there are observations of um, X-ray jets, right? And these are X-ray synchrotron jets extending over tens or hundreds of kiloparsecs. The electrons that are producing this emission, this is synchrotron emission, they would be cooling on more or less kiloparsec scales, right? So that you see emission over length scales much, much longer than these electrons should be existing. Okay, so there has to be a process that's in situ in the jet that's accelerating, and there's no shocks there, not that we can see. Okay, so um, this type of process seems to be a natural, uh, a natural solution to these type of problems. Okay, back to shocks. Um, right, so uh, Alicia told you how exciting the Crab Nebula is. I agree with her 100%. Um, it is one of the most fascinating sources. Um, extends the uh, uh, emission spectrum extending up to PV, uh, above a PV in energies, which is, is really remarkable. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later in the, in the, uh, in the talk. Um, but there are also gamma ray bursts. And I think for those of you interested in uh, 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 and, uh, these neutron star mergers, um, of course, the electromagnetic counterparts to these, uh, to these systems or many gravitational events producing gamma ray bursts, um, understanding the electromagnetic signatures is, is quite key. And so these are definitely relativistic outflows and they definitely produce relativistic shocks, okay? Um, and there are also relativistic shocks, of course, occurring at the termination shocks of, of various high power radio galaxies. Um, and these, all of these are, have been considered in the past as, as possible sources of ultra-energy cosmic rays. Um, relativistic shocks in general, okay? So, Let's go back to the picture that we had yesterday. Um, so for non-relativistic shock, we have our shock here. Let's do it in the shock frame. The flow comes in, flow goes out. For relativistic shock, you have a slightly different scenario because the adiabatic index of the gas changes. Well, I mean, five thirds, it's four thirds. The shock is, the velocity is coming into the shock at effectively the speed of light or with a very high Lorentz factor, let's say. Um, and the um, ultra-relativistic limit tells you that the outflow is moving away from the shock at a fraction of the speed of light, C over three, okay? So this is just the consequence of, of your mass conservation uh, and energy conservation laws. Okay, the thing is that's a big difference between non-relativistic shocks. There's two major differences. The first is in the, in the non-relativistic case, we didn't really worry about the change in the magnetic field when we're doing the transforming between upstream frames, downstream frames, and shock frames. That's no longer the case, right? So now we have to take into account that you have to do a Lorentz transformation on the, uh, on the background magnetic field, um, on the ambient magnetic field rather. Um, and what this does is it will tend to boost it into the plane. Um, <clears throat> these are what we call superluminal shocks. Um, and this is the norm in a, in a, for relativistic sy systems, right? You really need to fine tune this magnetic field to be almost exactly parallel to the shock propagation direction, or you're in this regime, certainly in the downstream. Okay. The second interesting fact is that in order to outrun the shock, so for a particle to go from downstream back into the upstream, it has to be able to move basically faster than this velocity in the downstream. Um, and then if you do a Lorentz transformation to the upstream, it basically has to be moving faster than the shock would be seen to move in the upstream, relative to the upstream. So you have now this particle that's just going out ahead of the shock, but the shock is right behind it, moving almost at the speed of light as well. Okay. And so if you check, uh, this basically says that the, the parallel component of the velocity has to be greater than the shock velocity. Um, and so we can assume that this is very, very close to unity. And therefore, uh, we can work out that all particles are basically within a small little uh, loss cone, one over the Lorentz factor of the shock. 
as soon as you leave that little cone, you're back downstream, yeah? So you just go poke your nose just out ahead of the shock, deflect a tiny bit, the shock will overtake you, and you're back downstream. Okay, so this is a major difference between uh, shock, uh, non-relativistic and relativistic shocks. Um, this might seem like it's very difficult to do, and in fact it might be, right? Um, but we now are in the age when we can do these very, very impressive, uh, fully kinetic relativistic shock simulations. So this is now solving all the physics of the shock transition. Everything is included in there. And this is a little particle, as you can see, it's, it's scooting back and forth across the shock. And the reason it's able to do that is because the field here is, is subdominant. The field is very weak, and so you produce very strong, intense magnetic fluctuations, which means that the particle, up to a certain point, doesn't care at all about the fact that there's this strong magnetic field. Um, at some point, this will start to become important again, and that determines effectively a cutoff in the maximum energy. Um, and so this is a plot of what the spectrum would look like from a Monte Carlo simulation. Um, and so this is, yeah, EDNDE, -E, um, or if you just turn it back into a DNDE, is get about e to the minus 2.2. This is the, the what's called the universal or spectrum uh, that comes in the ultra relativistic limit. And this matches quite well with observations and is only a little bit different from the non relativistic case. Okay, um, <clears throat> there is, of course, another uh, very interesting scenario which can happen, if, again, if you're very interested in uh, neutron star mergers or other very intense electromagnetic um, uh, events where there's, there's basically very strong intense photon fields, very uh, large magnetic fields, um, you can start to rely on more ex exotic mechanisms. Um, and so one such mechanism is called the converter mechanism. So here you, you, you do something quite, quite clever. Um, so you, you get around the fact that this magnetic field is trying to get you away from your shock or your shear layer. Um, by having a, an inelastic collision. So you imagine you have a proton. Proton then has a collision with a, with a photon, and then it produces a neutron. And the neutron doesn't care about the magnetic field at all, so it just zips off up here. It overtakes the shock. It goes quite far ahead of the shock. There's no deflection on it at all. Um, and then it, it has another reaction, uh, has another inelastic collision. It produces another, uh, converts back to a proton, and it loses energy in all of this process. But then it gets swept up by the shock, and it gets a huge kick in energy when it gets swept up by the shock again, uh, order gamma squared. Okay, so you, even though you've lost energy in these two processes, the net effect, if it's a highly relativistic system, is an energy gain. Okay, um, and you can do the same process also for electron positrons. Um, so you can have uh, electron positron in the deep Kleinishina regime. It produces uh, an inverse Compton scattering electron positron pair. Uh, then the pair, the pair produces, or rather, the electron produces the photon if, through inverse Compton, then it decays into electron-positron pair, and so this would be the same process here. So this is now an electron converts, produces a high-energy photon, photon goes up ahead of the shock, then it reacts with, uh, with another photon, produces an electron-positron pair, and then those come back. Okay. Um, the interesting thing is uh, that this, this spectrum is thought to be very hard, um, although uh, I think a lot more work needs to be done on this specific process. Okay, so that's just a, a sample of uh, various different acceleration mechanisms. Has anyone any questions at that point? No? Okay. All right, so we can all consider ourselves experts on the acceleration part. Um, so takeaway is there are many processes that can produce high energy particles. And now what we want to do is connect that to the observations, right? So to, to say, how do they emit? Okay, so um, again, many of you may be familiar with this, uh, but I'll uh, hopefully give, a, let's say, a new insight onto, onto the, some familiar topics. This one. Yeah, what's the, the, the plot in the bottom? That you have time against uh, what? Energy, so Lorentz factor, Lorentz factor of the particle. Lorentz. So the particle is, again, just doing this Fermi cycles back and forth across the shock. Um, it looks, the reason that it seems to be doing this large excursion into the upstream, despite what I had said earlier, 
um, is because all of this is, is done in the downstream frame. So in the downstream frame, these simulations are always done in the downstream frame. Um, it's just easier to set them up that way. Uh, the shock is only moving at basically C over three. So the shock is still moving quite slow in this frame. So the particles seem to move quite far ahead. But if you were in the upstream frame, the shock would just be right behind these particles all the time. And so yeah, you can see that every time it's, it's more or less doing a cross, you see this steps in energy. Okay, so back to my um, cheap cartoons. So I'm gonna tell you about a unified picture of non-thermal, try to convey to you a unified picture of non-thermal electron emission. Okay, so um, we want to sort of move away from, if you, those of you who study this, you, you work out your uh, retarded potentials, for example, um, if you want to do synchrotron or various other schemes, you have your retarded potentials, you take the, the Fourier transforms, and then you try to work out what is the, the power radiated in different spectra. Um, and it's rather tedious and long-winded calculations, um, but many of the key results can be derived in a very simple way. Okay. Um, so here I want you to imagine I have this, this uh, electron here, and I have a plane wave which is just propagating along. Right? And... Um, <coughs> As you know, if you wiggle a charge, uh, the charge will, will radiate, right? It's uh, basically, it's, it's, its Coulomb field is pointing to where it was at a, an earlier time or a late, uh, where it thinks it should be, and this creates um, fluctuating electromagnetic fields. Okay, so um, <coughs> we know here, if we just consider again, in the basically in the electron's rest frame, so that was the trick here, uh, the dominant, force on the particle is just the electric field. The, the magnetic field, remember, is just U over C or V over C cross B. So it's going to be a small parameter. So to lowest order, this is uh, the, the acceleration of the charge. Um, and the radiating charge, as I'm sure you know, or at least once upon a time knew, um, is just uh, that associated to a Hertzian dipole. So L is the, the power. Um, and this is just this form, well-known formula here, 2 over 3 E y dot squared. This is just the dipole. Um, uh, the moment, type of moment, um, over C cubed. Okay, and you can just rearrange that, as playing, playing with this, um, and this should be, uh, again, also a relatively familiar concept, because this quantity here is nothing other than the Thomson cross-section, um, and this is uh, basically the, the energy of light, right? So we have an electromagnetic wave, uh, we have the electric energy and the magnetic energy, and they're, they're the same in uh, the case of a, a plane wave. Okay, so we have a very simple expression for the, the power emitted. It's just the uh, Thomson cross-section times the energy density in, in this light, on this plane wave, uh, times uh, the speed of light. Okay, um, but the thing to bear in mind is, of course, that nothing that I showed on the previous slide actually really relied on the fact that it was a plane wave. Uh, and we only really cared that the, that the electron was some, something shook the electron, okay? And so we can generalize that formula there, um, basically say that the power radiated um, uh, was now just this in a more generic form, okay? So it's just rather than the, uh, the, electric f the energy density in the, in, the, in the plane wave, it's rather just twice the energy in the electric, electric field, okay? And so what we want to do is, is generalize this for, for relativistic particles. Um, and so we'll take the ultra relativistic limit so we don't worry about uh, factors of V over C. Uh, we set it always equal to one. Um, and we'll consider in turn synchrotron and inverse Compton emission. Okay, so synchrotron emission 101. Um, everyone knows uh, this is a particle, we all know now anyway, I hope, uh, as a particle in a magnetic field. And it does, it's magnetized, it does helical motion. And the idea is again, radiating charges uh, or accelerating charges radiate um, and then they produce what we call, if it's in a magnetic field, we call this synchrotron radiation. And I guess you'll learn more about this um, at the weekend. All right, so let's see how far we can get with our, our little formula here. So uh, if in the electron's rest frame, we do a Lorentz transformation into this, so gamma is the Lorentz factor of the particle, beta is its velocity. So in the particle's own rest frame, uh, the electric field is given by, by the, uh, the boosted 
acoustic fields. So unprimed is in the lab frame, primed is in the electron frame. Um, and so from this, we can find the boosted power. So we just plug this in for our expression for the electric field. Um, and so it's fairly straightforward. We can see what we have here. And then if we now um, assume in the lab frame that the electric field was zero, which again, in astrophysical plasmas, the electric field is usually much less than the magnetic field. So this is a reasonably good approximation. Um, and then we have uh, that the, uh, the, the power emitted uh, by a single particle is uh, takes this form here in the electron zone rest frame, which then takes this form here. Um, but you should also know that the emitted power is a Lorentz invariant, right? Because L prime is just the amount of energy emitted um, in a certain time. Um, but of course, that's the, related to the proper time, moving clocks slow down. Um, and the amount of energy is also uh, compressed as well. So you, you lose energy, um, the, the, the phase basis is compressed. Um, and so what you end up getting is uh, that this L prime is equal to L, the radiated power is a Lorentz invariant. And now we have exactly what we, what we need. Uh, we've derived the synchrotron power formula, which um, may be familiar to many of you. Um, <clears throat> and of course, if we angle over, average over all possible angles, so this was, uh, due to the angle between the magnetic field and the, and the particle's velocity, um, we see that we get uh, an averaged uh, luminosity, uh, which is, has this form here. So it scales as the Lorentz factor squared um, and the magnetic energy density. Okay. Um, the physics of this was first um, really uh, elucidated by, by Julian Schwinger um, in the late 40s. Um, and so the idea is very, uh, very simple and intuitive again. So we have, uh, imagine a particle uh, at rest. It has uh, an isotropic, uh, almost isotropic uh, field associated to it. So it's Coulomb field. Um, if you now give it a boost, it's now moving with a very high Lorentz factor. So then the radiation is effectively beamed into an angle that's about one over gamma or a half opening angle of one over gamma. Yeah. So if you have a distant observer, this particle is moving in this magnetic field. You have a distant observer. Um, and so when the particle is over here, all the emission is beamed up this way. Mr. Schwinger doesn't see it. At some point it comes into his line of sight. He starts to see it. So he detects, I'm seeing a signal. Then it goes around its motion here. And at some point he doesn't see it anymore. So he stops, no longer a signal. And so the duration over which um, Mr. Schwinger sees his, his pulse is uh, T2 minus T1, um, and taking into account, uh, this is basically just a Doppler effect, um, and we see that the time delta T, which was the, to move across here, across theta, um, is uh, compressed by, or boosted by a factor of uh, gamma squared. Okay? And this is interesting because delta T is nothing other than uh, one over omega times uh, divided by the gyro radius, a gyro frequency, and so we can define a characteristic frequency which scales as the Lorentz factor cubed times the relativistic gyro frequency. Okay? So that tells us a characteristic frequency associated to the, uh, the emission that uh, is, is seen by the observer. Okay, um, so if you do a slightly more, more thorough uh, derivation of this, there's a, you can put a, a small number in front of here. Um, although it still doesn't correspond to, uh, there is a subtle meaning to what, what this is. Um, so the synchrotron is basically like a lighthouse, so it's just sweeping by your line of sight, and you observe a critical frequency that's reasonably close to this value here, which is gamma squared EB over MC. Um, if you do a very detailed calculation of the spectrum, um, and if I had time, I would actually give you a very simple way of deriving this, um, which gives you, very, well, within a factor of a few, with almost the same scalings. Um, you can work out what is the, the spectrum emitted by a single particle, um, and it involves this rather rather ugly um, integral here over a modified Bessel's function. Um, but if you just plot it, uh, you can see it, it has a very simple, simple structure. It's fairly broad band, um, so it emits over a broad range of frequencies, um, and it has a peak at about 0.29 times uh, this frequency. Um, the physical meaning of this frequency actually is that that corresponds to half the energy is emitted above this frequency and half the energy is emitted below this frequency. Um, but the peak in the actual emitted emission that you see 
is at this, this frequency here, 0.29. Um, if you're interested, a very simple, rather than working with this, a very simple approximation is, is this 1.85. Um, and then yeah, that's the orange line compared to the blue line. So uh, if, if you're interested in doing these calculations yourself, you don't necessarily need to do this, this horrible integral, which is numerically challenging. Um, a simple expression gives you a fairly good approximation. Um, the key things, of course, uh, maybe just, just to put, highlight uh, the, the asymptotic behavior for, for very small x, x is nu over nu c, is it goes as the frequency to the one third, um, and then above, uh, it basically cuts off exponentially. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and one final point is that to notice that x here actually also has an angular dependence, so it depends on the angle. So that doing these calculations rigorously, you quite laborious. They really are quite laborious. Um, so I'm going to give you another way. It's less laborious. Okay. Um, we take the fact that most of the emission is, is coming, uh, coming at this point here. And so we just completely dismiss all of the complicated uh, kernels, as we call them, for these integrals. So if we want to work out the total emission from a system, what we would do is we would integrate over all particles in the system. So this is our spectrum. So dn, de, d omega. D omega represents the anisotropy in the spectrum. Um, and if it's relatively smooth um, and, uh, and, and close to iso isotropic anyway, uh, then we can just replace this d omega by 1 over 4 pi. Um, and so now we have a fairly simple expression for working out the total luminosity from a source in a given direction. Um, and rather than doing something very complicated, we can make a very simple approximation where we say that the total power emitted is what we would expect from the formula I showed you earlier. So the, uh, the, the, the synchrotron uh, emission formula, power, um, and then just assume that it's all emitted at a delta function, so at exactly one frequency, this frequency here. Okay. Um, so we can play around with that. Um, and this again gives us a nice bit of, bit of insight. So the synchrotron power basically scales, remember, as the Lorentz factor squared times the magnetic energy density. So it's just E squared, B squared. Um, the critical frequency here uh, is basically scales as the Lorentz factor squared times the magnetic, times the magnetic field. So it goes as E squared B. And so if I want to work out the total power emitted, um, I can just take the synchrotron power times the, uh, the, the, the spectrum that I'm injecting, so E to the minus S. Um, and times the ed nu, uh, where nu is evaluated at this this value here. Um, and so what I'm left with is the synchrotron goes as e squared b squared, spectrum minus s, and this goes as eb inverse. And I play around with this, and I see I get a very, very simple result, that my power law in electrons gives me a power law in photons in the synchrotron emission. This is what I showed you yesterday in one of the last slides. So if I have an e to the minus 2 spectrum, I would get a frequency to the minus 1 half. It's a well-known result. Um, and so you can see also the scaling with the magnetic field. Um, and if you do a more detailed calculation, um, much more rigorous, you get exactly the same result. Okay, so Slight renormalization. OK, so there's a, a nice, uh, simple result. Um, OK, so I wanted to just make a few uh, additional insights on synchrotron radiation that might be uh, interesting to to all of you, I hope. Um, one thing is, is, is a curiosity, um, uh, which always slightly amused me. Um, the synchrotron photon peaks, so I can, I can rewrite the, the energy of the photon that's emitted, divided by the rest mass of an electron, and it can be reduced to a very simple form. So this is a very easy formula to remember. Uh, it's basically the synchrotron photons divided by the rest mass of an electron is about a half gamma squared b over b crit, where b crit is the critical uh, Schwinger field. Um, so it's about 4.4 by 10 to the 13 Gauss. Um, so it's just a fundamental quantity. It's basically the limit of, of classical electrodynamics. Um, and the energy radiated um, as a part, ah, yeah, right. So the energy that's radiated, we know the power. So this is L, this is the single, single uh, particle power emitted. And we know the time at which it sweeps by your line of sight. Right? So we have this lighthouse that's sweeping by your line of sight. We take the product of these two numbers. That tells me the total energy that's emitted. Right? So the total energy emitted is gamma squared alpha f here, which is the fine structure constant, uh, times b over b crit times the rest mass. 
Okay, so that's the total energy that's emitted. Um, and then we can divide this number by this number, which then tells us how many photons are emitted at this critical frequency. And what we get is the fine structure constant. Everything else pops out. But, there we go. This is the second time. I definitely won't do it a third time. Um, we'll see. Um, how do you emit a fraction of a photon? Alpha is less than 1 over 100. Right? Um, and so what this is really showing is that classical electrodynamics is a limit. Yeah? In reality, emission is always a quantum process. And what's happening here is in the limit of a very large number of electrons, everything's fine. Yeah? But in reality, if you take a single electron, it's actually a, a transition probability. There's a probability that while it sweeps by your line of sight, it'll emit a photon. And classically, the, the, you can correlate these two things by saying, I know my particle emits somewhere on a trajectory, I just don't know where. Yeah? So it is a, it's a quantum process. Okay, so this will come back, I'll come back to this because again, there's a nice connection with, with inverse Compton. Okay, um, so one final um, interesting, interesting fact, um, which is uh, what's called the synchrotron burn-off limit. So it's a very useful uh, or interesting result. So electrons, as we know, as they radiate, they cool, right? So that's why we want to work out these formulae. So the cooling time is just the, the energy divided by the, by the power, right? So d dt. Um, and then we can work out, plugging in the numbers, it goes as 1 over the, the energy times the magnetic field squared. Yeah, so one of these gammas cancels out. Um, so recall that the gyro period is just 2 pi divided by the gyro frequency, um, which scales as the Lorentz factor over the magnetic field. Right? And so these two, we can equate these two times. One is the time it takes to do a, a gyration, and one is the time it takes to lose basically, well, at least half its energy, okay, which is this time scale. And when we equate these two numbers, uh, we see that we get this expression here. So gamma squared B over B crit um, is one over the fine structure constant. This is why it's very useful when you do electrodynamics and why particle physicists use these, these quantities. Everything becomes very simple. Um, but we already saw that, uh, there should be a half here, um, uh, the, this, the critical frequency, uh, the energy divided by the rest mass energy goes as gamma squared B over B crit. And then this would just be equal 1 over the fine structure constant. And so in order to um, get, so the main conclusion here is that this number here, 1 over the fine structure constant, is roughly 137. And therefore, the maximum photon energy that you can really produce in the situation where your just particle is moving in a regular magnetic field um, is a few hundred MeV. Okay. Now, if you recall yesterday, Alicia was telling you about crab flares. These are synchrotron emission that's extending up to well beyond a GeV, in fact, tens of GeV. Um, so how does this how does this occur? Okay, so we need to find ways around this. Okay, so that's synchrotron for now. Um, so I'd like to turn our attention now to the other, uh, let's say, key process for for gamma ray astrophysics. Anyway. Um, is inverse Compton. Okay, so uh, the idea here is, is is very straightforward. Imagine I have a relativistic electron. I have a photon coming in here. I can transform into the electron's frame, and then I have the photon is essentially essentially moving um, along the direction of the electron, to, very close to it. Okay, so I now know, know the energy because uh, the uh, omega k is is a four vector. Um, it undergoes a scattering. Right, so it goes off then at some, some angle, um, and uh, the energy, some energy is exchanged, and so the electron now can, can have a little recoil, the photon goes off in this direction, but then I do a transformation back into the laboratory frame, and I see that my photon is now moving off with, in principle, a very large Lorentz factor. Okay? So H nu double prime, so after being scattered over its initial energy, this can increase by factor of, so this could be two, this could be two, so four gamma squared. So it's a big kick in energy. Um, how effective is this process? Well, that's what I was talking about, our unification here. Okay? So we have the power. We know scales as the average electric uh, energy in the electric field. And so what's the energy in the electric field? 
Well, again, we consider a relativistic particle. We embed that particle in an isotropic field. All right, so if an isotropic photon field, then there's no net momentum. All right, so for every photon going one way, it's a photon going the other way. Um, and so therefore, the energy density transforms like the, the zeroth element of the, of the stress uh, or the energy momentum tensor. And so it goes as P mu, P nu times the electric uh, energy density. Um, and therefore, the photon energy density, or which is just two times this, um, is um, transforms like this. And if I average over all possible, uh, average over cosine theta, um, what I get is that the photon energy density in the uh, electrons frame has this form here. Yeah. Um, and so the rate, again, using the fact that the radiated power is a Lorentz invariant, so what I would plug this in here, and then L is equal to L prime. And so what I get is the power emitted from inverse Compton looks very familiar. Doesn't it? it looks exactly the same as the synchrotron emission, four over three gamma squared, sigma T CU. Um, ah, that should be U photon. <laughs> okay, so you can see it is exactly the same here, um, but it should be U photon. And here's Mr. Compton uh, showing the showing it in action. Okay, so we now have a, have a nice result. Um, and so let's, let's simplify it. Um, consider a simple monochromatic photon field. So all photons have an energy uh, epsilon naught, it's just h nu naught, and an associated energy density, which is just uh, the number density of photons times the photon energy. Um, so we saw that the scattered energy has uh, epsilon one, so that's the energy after the scattering after being uh, upscattered by the, by the electron, goes as gamma squared, and then times the, the angles that appear, uh, times the initial energy. And if these two angles are, are uncorrelated, which they should be, um, then the average uh, upscattered photon has an energy gamma squared, epsilon naught. There's maybe a small numerical factor in front of that. Okay, so let's do an example. Consider a CMB photon. So the CMB you know, is 2.7 Kelvin. Um, it's uh, photon energy dense, uh, photon energy of average of about 6.6, .6, 10 to the minus four electron volts. And so if we take a TV electron, we upscatter the CMB. Uh, so TV electron has roughly two 10 to the six Lorentz factor. And so our gamma squared epsilon naught will give us 2.6 GeV, okay? Um, the same electrons in a 10 microgauss magnetic field, however, would only emit a 0.2 electron volt synchrotron photons, okay? So um, you can clearly see that inverse Compton is, is, is where we're gonna be producing most of our, our gamma rays um, and synchrotron are producing radio to, to X-rays. Okay. So <coughs> what about the spectrum? Um, if you wanna work out the inverse Compton spectrum, this is a rather involved calculation um, and it's, it's not even simple to write out. Um, take many lines. Um, so uh, the, the electron spectrum is smooth. We can still do the same, play the same game. The power is emitted. Um, our electron distribution is approximately isotropic. And the only difference is here now we use the um, inverse Compton luminosity. Um, and oh, um, we could put in the full um, expression for uh, scattering, scattering rates for, for uh, inverse Compton photons. Um, but we can also just play the same game with our simple delta function approximation. We know that the total power is, um, is given by our, our formula that we derived previously. And the upscattered uh, photons here, I could have put our epsilon, but mu is all the same, um, is basically gamma squared times mu naught. Okay, so for again, monochrom monochromatic uh, target field. And so repeating the steps from before, we would just, uh, make some small small changes, but still as games as gamma squared. Um, and then what we would get is that the frequency behaves exactly the same, goes as this S minus one over two. So if I have an E to the minus two spectrum, then I would produce an E to the minus uh, one half uh, frequency uh, spectrum, but at much higher energies. Okay, um, before, Going on, a small digression. We could have played exactly the same game, by the way, with, with um, hadronic interactions. So I know that the, uh, when I have a proton collides, an energetic proton above threshold collides with another proton, it produces a neutral pion. The neutral pion decays into a gamma ray. That gamma ray carries off around 10% of the initial proton energy. So I can play the same game. I can just say, I know the power produced in, or the, I know the cooling time for, um, 
for, for, for PP, in, uh, PP uh, rate, let's say, um, and then assume all the energy is in, in one particular, particular energy. Um, and so here, uh, the, the cooling time doesn't scale as the energy squared, but only as the energy, um, and the cooling time is independent of energy. Um, and so this changes things a little bit, and so I just write it in a slightly different way, because E squared the NDE is usually how we plot it in gamma ray astrophysics. Um, what you end up with is E uh, times this luminosity here, which we can again work out. Um, and then uh, this scales as E to the gamma two minus S. And so if you have a flat E to the minus two, uh, sorry, if you have an E to the minus two injection spectrum, this E squared the NDE gives you a flat uh, gamma ray spectrum. Okay. All right. Um, so there is a subtlety in inverse Compton, um, which many of you might be aware of, um, but just to, to, uh, to highlight it, um, a CMB photon, again, this is what the, the same example I gave before, right? So if I have a CMB photon and I scatter with the TV electron, um, I get uh, an upscattered uh, photon, about 2.6 GeV. But if I had a TV electron and I upscattered a UV photon, so, so let's say if our, my monochromatic photon field was at um, 10 electron volts, then this would give an upscattered energy of 40 TeV. And what's wrong with this? The upscattered photon has more energy than the initial electron. Yeah? So clearly I'm violating energy conservation. Um, and so this is because we neglected the quantum recoil of the electron, and this is the well-known klein sheen effect. Um, so if you actually do the, the calculations properly, uh, with more, uh, more, more care, um, then what you will find is that the upscattered uh, electron divided by the, um, by the, the energy of the, of the electron um, cannot exceed this number. Okay, this is the, the, the upper limit, and as you can see, this is this quantity, this quantity is the same, so this is always less, um, so it approaches one, but it's always less than one. And so clearly in the limit of four gamma squared epsilon naught over gamma, uh, this, in this limit, clearly we would have reproduced everything we did before. Yeah. So it would have been fine, um, but uh, you run into problem when in the frame of the electron, the gamma has a comparable energy, right? If I cancel the, the, the gammas here, um, and so if in the frame of the electron, the energy density, of the, the energy of the photon was comparable to the rest mass. Okay, so um, you can do these calculations. So these were first done by, um, by Frank Jones in the late 60s, um, and you end up with a rather unpleasant uh, formula, including some dialogue rhythm functions. Um, so we tend to also uh, use approximations for this. So you can see the blue line here is the exact solution. Uh, the orange line is a well-known result, which is nice to work with analytically, but doesn't really hold so well once you go above um, around the transition. And here's a very nice simple formula that I just made up, um, which you can see is almost indistinguishable from the exact solution. Uh, so if you want to save yourself some computing cycles when you're doing this, that's a nice simple um, expression that works very well. Okay, so basically the bottom line is that the corrections, all they effectively do is just reduce the cross section. So we could take the same formula that we did before and we just have this additional, rather than using the Thompson cross section, we use the Thompson cross-section multiplied by, by this correction factor. Okay. Um, and so I want to highlight that this, and this is relevant for what comes next, is that Kleiner Sheena suppression does two things. Okay. Um, so it, it suppresses the emission when the upscattered photon energy becomes the, the uh, uh, close to the, to the electron energy, so you, 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 the cross-section reduces, so the rate at which you produce photons also reduces, but you also suppress cooling, right? So the inverse Compton becomes, cooling becomes less effective because you're producing less photons, right? This makes sense. Um, okay, so i uh, just gonna say in the slides that follow, I'm mostly gonna use simple cartoons because it's more easy to, to, to visualize, um, but any of you who are serious about this, um, you can have a look, there's, there's several packages, but the one, um, Gamera, uh, is what a lot of my colleagues use, um, and it, it, it's very effective and very easy to use. So it's a C++ library, but it has a Python interface. Um, okay, so 
Um, let's discuss single zone models, okay? And so I have a love-hate relationship with single zone models, um, and I'll explain why. Um, okay, so what is a single zone model? Well, it is exactly what it says. It's a single zone, right? So I just have some region where um, particles are effectively cooling and radiating, right? So it's where all my emission is coming from, this single zone. Okay, so it's full of gas, magnetic field, um, photons, whatever it is, okay? And it's all homogeneous and uniform. Oh, okay. Um, somewhere here, could be a shock, could be magnetic reconnection, could be something, there is acceleration taking place, okay? And the acceleration is injecting um, and for simplicity, I'll just assume it's, it's, it's steady, but it could be, it's injecting uh, energetic particles at some rate, some time, with some spectrum, okay? Again, it's somewhere in there. I'm agnostic as to what, where exactly it is and what exactly it is. Um, so particles are injected, and for example, electrons, um, I've neglected Bram Stralung, I'm sorry, I just didn't have time, um, and there's other losses like adiabatic losses, but the cooling rate, if I just consider inverse Compton and synchrotron, has this form here, so I'm using the fact that the general form looks very similar. Um, this is synchrotron cooling, this is inverse Compton cooling with the possible correction due to klein Nishina. Okay, um, and so I can construct a very basic equation which describes the evolution of all my particles in the single zone. So uh, here's the rate of change, I have uh, the uh, basically the, the flux of energies um, as they move through. Um, so the number of particles are conserved in all of these interactions, um, but the energy is lost. Yeah. Okay, so I'm conserving number, but I'm not conserving energy. Um, I allow for the possibility that there might be some escape. So my single zone, the particles could leave and then just simply don't contribute anymore to the emission. Um, and then I have my injection, okay, so. All right, so um, let's consider uh, simple ways of, of solving this. Um, so I have, uh, I'm gonna neglect escape, right? So I'm gonna just say my particles probably radiate most of their energy or the ones that are interesting do. Um, and so I'm going to write down this equation here where I've just replaced uh, the cooling rate to be minus PE squared. So like synchrotron or inverse Compton in the Thomson regime. Um, and so I have this very simple equation here. I could in fact actually solve this in a very general sense take a little plus transform, play around with it, and invert it, um, but you wouldn't be any wiser. Um, so I can solve this equation in two interesting limits, okay? So if my cooling rate is, is, is BE squared, then I can work out a cooling time, um, which is just one over BE, and therefore for energies less than one over BT, uh, losses are irrelevant, okay? So these particles just simply don't cool, um, and so you just accumulate them in time. For energy above this uh, critical energy, so one over BT, basically I've lost all my energy. You know? So I'm just uh, reaching some sort of equilibrium where energy in equals energy out. So, it's, so it reaches some equilibrium state. Okay, so we can simplify this um, to approximate equations. There we are. Okay, so the first equation is the case where E is much less than one over BT. Losses are irrelevant. Cooling just hasn't happened yet. Um, and so I just have this equation here, which I can solve. Um, I hope you can all solve. All right, so you just integrate over the injection. So if, if the injection had time dependence, then this might be a bit more involved. Okay. Um, in the other limit, if my energy is much greater than one over BT, then I have to solve this equation, but this is also trivially done. And here I've just rewritten it back in the form in which I didn't make this approximation. The cooling break would be a bit more complicated. Um, and so this is simply that the, the number density is one over the, the cooling uh, the power, or um, cooling power, um, and then the integral from some E to some E max over the, uh, the, the injection. So this is an integral over energy, this is an integral over time. Okay, because it's reached equilibrium, it doesn't care about time anymore. Okay, so uh, how does that look like for power laws? Okay, so I like power laws, shocks produce power laws, this is great, um, and we see power laws all the time. Okay. So 
if I assume that my injection is some steady injection, Q0, e to the minus s, between some range E0 and E max, then I see that the below 1 over Bt, um, I have just simply the power law accumulated in time, and above uh, 1 over Bt, I have this uh, spectrum, which is steepened by 1. Yeah? It increases by 1, and it increases by 1 because, specifically, the gamma squared dependence on E dot, on the cooling. Uh, free, uh, cooling rate, the power. Okay, so if I just multiply by ES to flatten this out, what I would get is a cooling break, and as time increases, this gets smaller, so it moves to the left. Okay, in reality, what's happening is particles that were injected very early, maybe I can go back, oh. the particles that were injected very early, so an early in time, are all gone. They've all been radiated above some, some energy range, and so what you're seeing here is these are just freshly injected particles because all the ones that were injected at an earlier time have just completely gone and these ones are just simply accumulated. Okay, okay so we can now apply those rather crude um, derivations that we, we made earlier using our delta function approximations to construct um, some simple uh, single zone models. Um, so let's consider the first case. So I have the magnetic energy density is larger than the photon energy density, and I'm ignoring Klein-Nashina effects. Okay, so maybe the photons are at such low energy that I never reached Klein-Nashina. Okay, so what I'm plotting here is nu f nu, so that's e squared dNdE. Um, so this is energy ergs per square centimeter per second, etc. So there's a number of critical frequencies here, so I'll just go through them one by one. So this is basically, I injected this power law within some range from E0 up to E max. So below E0, there's no particles to really produce uh, those the, the delta function. But I know that the synchrotron spectrum goes as uh, one third below, uh, below the peak. And so nu f nu then goes as frequency to the four thirds. Okay. Then um, again, I would have this minus uh, s minus one over two, and I'm multiplying by nu, so I get this s minus three over two. So I get this rather, um, in principle, get this hard spectrum. Okay, so if I take s equals two, then this would be uh, plus one half. Okay, so it's increasing. And then I, this is my cooling break. So this corresponds to the break in the spectrum, and above the spectrum, I steepen by one in the particle spectrum, and therefore I steepen by a half in the, um, in the, the uh, photon spectrum. And so it goes as s minus two over two. So in the limit of, it was flat. If I had an e to the minus two spectrum, this would actually be flat. Um, and that's because you have equal energy per decade in the particles. It's in equilibrium. You have equal energy per decade in, in photon because it's, it's in equilibrium. Um, and then at some point it would cut off. Right? That's why I'd have some maximum energy would cut off. Um, and the inverse Compton, then again, I know it's the same slope here, right? Below the cooling break, it has the same slope. And then above, again, I'm in Thompson regime. It has the same slope as well. Okay. And at some point, it will be cutting off. Um, and the thing that is also relevant here is that the ratio of these peaks um, in most, uh, certainly in non-relativistic situations, is given by the ratio of these two, these two numbers. Okay. So u mag is greater than u photon. So you can see where the peaks are. Okay. What about the... The other case, that looked higher when I was drawing it. <laughs> um, so here now I have the magnetic energy density is less than the photon energy density, and I have no klein nishina and then I just shift this line, this line goes up. Okay, so there's nothing really new or interesting to see there. Um, I have a more additional interesting case. So what happens if my magnetic energy density is larger than the photon energy density, and klein nishina is included? So now, I have the same, my synchrotron spectrum uh, doesn't really change. Um, my inverse Compton doesn't change up to a point, but then this klein nishina suppression uh, kicks in. So my cooling is still the same. I'm dominated by synchrotron cooling because my magnetic energy density dominates over photon energy density. So I'm still in this regime steepening by one. Um, but now I've suppressed the emission of photons and therefore I get a very steep spectrum here at the highest energies. Okay, so there's one last case that's very interesting. 
and particularly topical with all the lasso results. And that's what happens in the final case that I didn't consider, where the magnetic energy density is less than the photon energy density, but klein sheen effects are important. Okay? Because now you're dominated by cooling on the photon field, but cooling on the photon field can be more complicated because of klein sheen suppression. And then so what shape does the spectrum take? Well, if I have, again, if I have a, what, so what I have a plot here, this is again produced by Gamera. What I have here is the, this parameter here is basically the ratio of the photon field to the, um, to the magnetic field. So if I take a five micrograms magnetic field, this is the synchrotron cooling time. Yeah, so the cooling time always goes as one over E for, for uh, synchrotron. Quantum corrections for synchrotron don't happen until you get crazy fields close to the critical field. Um, but for inverse Compton, if I have um, the same uh, radiation field, so the same temperature, but I change the energy density, this line just moves, moves up and down. Yeah? And so as I increase the energy density in the photon field, this curve moves down, moves down, moves down. And at some point, the cooling is dominated by, by inverse Compton. Um, but again, klein sheena suppression, it eventually starts to become less effective at cooling and synchrotron takes over again at some point. But if I were to take the uh, reciprocal sum of these, you sum the rates, not the times. Um, if, I, if I do that, I would end up with a total curve that ends up looking something like this. Yeah? And so if you recall, what I want is the cooling time, which is just E over, over this. Um, I would end up getting something that looks rather, rather different than just steepening by one. But in fact, I can even harden the spectrum. I can actually get harder electron spectrum because here they're cooling and here they're, they're, become, they're, they're not cooling at all. So you're, you're reducing the lower energy particles relative to the high energy particles because the high, low energy particles are cooling, cooling faster. Okay. Um, and so what you end up producing is actually rather flat um, uh, gamma ray spectra. Okay, so this is for an e to the minus two injection and you see you can even get quite hard uh, photon spectra. Um, one have to be a little bit careful with this because in principle this is, is a quantum effect um, so we want to be a little bit more careful. But these results, people who have compared these to the quantum, uh, doing the, the problem properly, quantum mechanically, um, or taking into account the, the, the rates, um, give very similar results. Okay, so the resulting photon spectrum remains hard. Okay, so this is the one last um, interesting case. Okay, so I'm going to now do some examples. I've picked two. Um, and I think they sort of highlight, um, but spoiler, uh, we're back to shocks, okay? Because uh, they're always the most interesting case. Okay, so um, uh, Alicia was also introduced yesterday, the concept of colliding wind binaries, and there's one colliding wind binary that's particularly fascinating, and it sits somewhere in this thing, the Carina Nebula. Um, here it is here, it's Eta Carina, right? So there's the Homunculus Nebula uh, sitting there, somewhere in the Carina Nebula. And if you zoom in on, uh, well, you can't actually zoom in anymore, but you have to use your imagination. We know from X-ray light curves that there's a binary in there, okay? So we know that there's, there's a binary because we see a periodic signal that comes from it, okay? a per periodic light curve. Um, and so what we think is happening is we have a very massive star, um, basically produced this big um, nebula in a, in, in a failed supernova or some massive eruption event. Um, so we have a very massive star, and then we have a very powerful star right next to it. Okay, and they're both quite quite strong stars, but I'll explain what they are in a bit. Okay, so we've got this massive star, um, which is is then on this 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 uh, very very small orbit, and the lighter companion is on this very eccentric orbit. So it has an eccentricity of about 0.8.9. Okay, so um, people were very interested when these binaries were first discovered, um, and devoted a huge amount of uh, effort into, into simulating them. And so here are various slices through um, hydrodynamic simulations um, of, 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 this, of this particular source. Um, and so you can see, due to the orbital motion, you produce these, these ring-like structures. Um, but here, this is in the plane. So this, the, the, um, the binary system is now coming in and out of the page. And what you see is that th because the uh, lower mass companion spends a lot of its time sort of 
away from the um, from the from the the, the bar, oh, bar mass center, um, it, and has a very very strong wind. It evacuates this low density channel. Um, people think this is very interesting and might explain some of the observational features. If you look in the plane, you see it whips around it, um, and then there's lots of complex uh, interplay between the two winds. So it's two powerful winds from these two stars, um, and a very complex environment, very turbulent. Um, but one thing that you have if you have two uh, two stars, two winds, and you have two shocks, okay, um, right? And so what you have, and what we think is happening, is we have a Wolf-Rayet star, which has a very fast wind, about 3,000 kilometers per second. This produces an adiabatic shock. And on the other side, we have a, this wind from this massive star, probably a luminous blue variable, um, and it has a velocity of a few, several hundred kilometers per second. But it's very dense, very high mass loss rate, um, and therefore you produce what's called a radiative shock, um, where basically a lot of the energy is emitted, um, and therefore you reduce the... Um, stiffness of the of the gas and so it compresses very rapidly and so you end up with this very strong contact discontinuity and very dense wall okay and so this shock system is moving around and this for uh theoreticians like myself is very exciting because you have a time dependent laboratory so the period of this is is, is uh, only a couple of years okay and so we can see this um, and try to study this and see what's happening for the non-thermal emission um, okay, so here is what we think is happening for the wind conditions, and this is a rather unique event uh, or a unique source. Um, so I'll just explain a little bit here that the, the, the thick lines are for um, the for the um, Eta Car A, so the very massive star. The grayish lines are for the companion. Um, and so we see because it has a larger shock velocity, the acceleration time is much less for the companion. Um, we have a flow time, which is effectively the uh, due to the the advection around the the, the shock. Um, so this is so, sort of like giving you a, an estimate for the Hillis limit. But we have a rather unique occurrence in the fact that the uh, because you have these very dense winds, it's the only place that I know of in the universe where the acceleration rate for the massive star is limited by hadronic interactions. So you're actually you, you can't accelerate any higher than this energy because PP interactions, so colliding with the gas. So it's really quite a fascinating result. And of course, then that means that you're going to be very bright in gamma rays. Anything you produce into protons goes straight into gamma rays. Okay, so we expect it to be very bright in gamma rays. Um, <clears throat> the situation is a little bit different at the companion. Um, here, you're going to be able to, you're not limited by uh, the uh, you're limited basically by the size of the system, not by the cooling rate. So things are as you would normally expect. Um, but for electrons, um, then you have various competing loss processes. So this is from Bremsstrahlung, inverse Compton, synchrotron. Um, and you can see that the electrons are limited by cooling. Okay, so why do I think this is a wonderful astroparticle physics laboratory? Um, and the answer is because it's pretty much got every process you can think of as going on here. Okay, so. What do we think we know about the, the two stars? We have Eta Car A, so this massive star, it has a wind speed 5, kilometers per, 500 kilometers per second, the surface magnetic field of a few hundred microgauss, um, and the maximum energy is limited by PP cooling. I already said that. Okay, so what kind of emission should it produce? Well, it should be very bright in gamma rays at about a GV. Its maximum energy is not so high, so I should produce this big bump okay, here like this. Um, I should, in principle, I should be accelerating some electrons there as well, um, and then I produce some uh, some inverse Compton emission. So I'm really just focusing on the gamma rays here. Um, but because I'm producing lots of pions, I'm also producing charged pions, and charged pions decay into electrons and positrons. So even if I'm only accelerating a small number of electrons from the gas, I'm going to be producing a lot from uh, from decay products. Okay, so very interesting. Um, what about the companion? So the companion star, much faster velocity, so larger maximum energy. The surface field is probably less than 100 microgauss, but um, some of those instabilities that I mentioned yesterday um, are believed to be playing a major part. Um, in fact, it must be playing a part to get up to these high energies. Um, and so if we take typical numbers that we expect for, for other systems, 10% of the wind power is going into the ions, 
a smaller fraction going into the electrons. Um, what we get is the primary electrons from the companion star, again, it's much faster, produce an inverse Compton spectrum that looks something like this. Okay, and then of course, there's also gonna be some, some secondary electrons that are produced. Okay, so when we sum over them all, we should get a spectrum that looks something like this, with a bump, and then another little bump. Okay, and what does the data actually look like? Well, here's where I told you things got very exciting, because the data is time variable. So depending on which part of the, of the orbit you see, um, so this is away from periastron, just close to periastron and during periastron, you see very different behavior. So away from periastron, it looks exactly like this. In fact, I'll talk to the person here. Okay, so these are, these are done numerically. Yeah, so these aren't just me drawing cartoons. Um, <clears throat> Here we've got new star data, so we also have X-rays that we have to have to match, um, and then we have the Fermi data points, which are these ones here, and in principle we have Hess points as well, um, which fall a little bit over here. Um, and so as we approach periastron, um, some things start to start to well, it starts to look a little bit different. Okay, you start to sort of smooth out the results here, and again, this is because you're sort of changing the shock conditions. An interesting thing happens when you um, get right to periastron, the thermal X-ray emission vanishes, completely vanishes. Um, and people say that this is due to the, the shock disappearing or the fact that the, um, uh, the acceleration basically switches off. Um, but we still see emission from new star. We still see very strong hard X-rays. Um, and we can account for these very hard X-rays, again, from these secondary inverse Compton electrons. But we still need to be accelerating protons. So protons, you need to accelerate continuously at both stars through this entire event. So it's really uh, a curious um, and remarkable laboratory. And so it needs to be studied um, as, as much as possible. All right, so that's all I wanted to say about that. Um, and so I will finish off coming back to my, my favorite topic, um, and, and Elisa's favorite, or one of her favorites, the Crab Nebula, okay? And um, what it broadly more means for, for, for relativistic shocks and for ultra high energy gamma ray sources. Okay, so here's the crab, um, and we believe the crab, or you know the crab is powered by this rotating neutron star, okay? And so here's what we see, here's what's powering it, and here's a simple theoretician's, theoretician's picture of it. It's a spherical cow, we have a pulsar in the center, it launches this wind, all right, so it launches a wind. The wind is this dark region here, yeah? Um, and it must be dark because the wind is just a rapid expansion. If there was any thermal motions in there at all, they're washed out um, almost instantly um, until you hit this shock, okay? Um, and I'm gonna try to convince you that this shock should be very relativistic and is very interesting and in driving most of the emission that you see here. Um, then this fills up the nebula. So this is the nebula here, which is all this emission we see out here. And at some point there should be, there should have been a supernova remnant uh, about a thousand years ago. Um, curiously for the crab, we don't see any evidence uh, of a shock, an outer shock, but we see lots of, of H alpha emission um, and dense gas out here. Okay, so we know that there's, uh, that something has passed through it. Okay, so the key point that I want to raise here is that, well, pulsars are very dense. Okay, and the work function, it's, it's very difficult to get any um, protons or other nuclei off the surface. In fact, there's, a, there's, a, there's an upper limit that what you can produce in terms of hadronic material in the wind of a pulsar is what's called the Goldreich Julian density, and it's a fairly small, small number. Okay, um, but you can have, because of the very intense magnetic fields that exist near the surface, you can have quite copious electron positron pair production from um, gamma gamma interactions, or, um, basically beta hydr uh, cascades. Um, and what this does then is it launches a relatively dense um, electron positron wind, um, and we can define a, a mass loading parameter, which is the total power emitted. So that's magnetic flux plus um, uh, material flux in terms of electron positrons, and maybe some protons or other nuclei. Um, and divided by the uh, the mass uh, the mass power output, um, and so this number you can write as the Lorentz factor of the wind times the magnetization of the wind plus one, um, and the magnetization here is the ratio of the pointing flux to the enthalpy flux density. Okay, so ratio ratio of 
um, energy in the fields versus the ratio of energy in the in, in the gas. Um, and in the absence of any losses or pair creation, this is a conserved quantity. Okay. So how large should that be? Um, so for uh, spinning neutron star, uh, this at the light cylinder, um, we can just say this number is much larger. This is a small number. So this is of order this. Um, and it should be the ratio of the light cylinder to the gyro radius of an electron, of a non-relativistic electron, um, in the very intense magnetic field. So this is a very huge number. Um, and then it should be uh, times the Goldreich Julian density divided by uh, the actual density. So the Goldreich Julian density is the amount of charges you need to screen uh, the electric field, screen these gaps, and, and allow this wind to propagate. So this should be a small number, but together, we think this should be in the order of 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7. Um, a thing to note about uh, relativistic gases is that the alphane speed is just the square root of this number. Same is true for a non-relativistic gas. Um, <clears throat> and so if we want the, the wind to have a sonic point, same as it is in our sun, uh, most stars, so we want it to be transalphanic at the light cylinder, which means this should be, the Lorentz factor should be the square root of the sigma. Um, and therefore here, I could just replace this by uh, gamma square, gamma cubed. And so gamma should be the cube root of this. So it's about 10 to the two. So at launch, the wind moves out with a Lorentz factor of 100. So that's the bulk Lorentz factor of the wind, not individual particles, but the bulk Lorentz factor of the wind. Um, and now here, we take this into, into account, that if this is conserved, then if I destroy any magnetic field, again, it should be, sigma should be also conserved. Um, but if I try to reduce the magnetic field, gamma must increase, the wind has to accelerate. You can think of this like, I have this rotating star, and I have all of these, the star has the magnetic field, which are like elastic bands, and if I start cutting the elastic bands, I release the tension, and it just accelerate. Okay. And this is um, problematic because think of it in terms of proper time. As the Lorentz factor increases, you go from here to the shock um, in a very short space of time as far as the particle is concerned or the wind is concerned. And you don't have a lot of time to annihilate magnetic field. Right? So magnetic reconnection or um, how to basically get a low magnetic field in this region here is, is, is very difficult. In fact, we don't know how it's done. Okay, and this is potentially a problem um, because we think then if, if they're still highly magnetized, if this sigma is still uh, quite, quite appreciable, um, by the time it hits the shock, then the shock is magnetized. And it's commonly believed that magnetized shocks are very bad accelerators. And the reason is very simple. The shock is moving away from the downstream at C over three. And if I have a very strong magnetic field, I can't catch up with the shock. I'm stuck on a magnetic field, um, and and I, I I just it's just game over. I get one cycle. I get a little kick in energy, but I know that the crab is producing multi PV electrons. Okay, so um, here this is just a, a pick simulation of a highly magnetized perpendicular electron positron shock. So you can see particles go in, they get stuck on magnetic fields, and it's game over. There's none of them really doing this bouncing back and forth like we saw in the earlier simulations. But there's a subtlety. The crab is not this perfect environment, but is almost certainly um, an oblique rotator. And oblique rotators have this uh, very interesting thing that everything in the, in the, let's say in the north part here is connected to the north pole, everything in the south part here is connected to the south pole, and in between it alternates. Yeah? And so here the magnetic field would be pointing into the plane, out of the plane, into the plane, out of the plane. You make this striped wind. Um, here are some state-of-the-art 3D kinetic simulations of that, and you see this structure um, persisting for quite some time. Um, this has an interesting um, implication because eventually this, this field sort of is, on average is very small. If you take the phase average, in fact, in the equatorial plane, it's zero, right? So it's basically zero in the equatorial plane, and then it increases as you move up to large, larger angles. Okay, so as you move away from the equatorial plane, on one side it's pointing in, on the other side it's pointing out. And so it's not this regular field on the equatorial plane, but it's rather something more complex, which on average cancels out. So you could say 
it's a fairly weak field on the plane, and outside um, it's doing something different. But there's another thing, because this is very similar to what I showed you earlier on for re magnetic reconnection. This is exactly the structure that we get for, um, it's a current sheet that's produced, um, and in current sheets you can produce spicer orbits. Okay, and so here is a Monte Carlo simulation done by my colleague, um, where here's the shock, so we're doing this in the shock frame, and this is an individual particle trajectory, and again, the key point is field is out of plane, so it rotates in one direction on one side of the plane, goes on to the other, rotates in the other direction, and so then you get these particles that in the downstream, they very easily get back into the upstream, and then they can do multiple shock cycles, okay, and they're gaining this uh, factor, um, Again, about a factor of two on each on each crossing, okay. Um, <clears throat> and so the resulting spectrum that you get, so these are for, for output from the Monte Carlo simulations. You can see that you're generating electrons up to several PeV, okay, even when you include losses, okay. So uh, shocks, in fact, when you take into account the global geometry, seem to be very effective. Um, at producing the emission um, or producing the electrons that are required. Um, and so we can use this as an input um, to a single zone model. Um, so this is our Q inject. Um, and then we can get a pretty reasonable fit to both the gamma rays and, and the, and the X so hard X rays and the gamma rays. So this isn't our fit. This is from the lasso paper. Um, but so in preparation. Um, okay. Uh, so this paper. My colleague, Gwenel Gisanti. Okay, so um, wanted to highlight a few few key points to generalize this. So we, we kind of have an idea of what we think might be happening in the crab, um, at least for the, for the steady emission. Um, and so let's just highlight some of the key points. Um, the pulsars in general are powered by their spin down luminosity. That's the source of energy. Okay. Um, this is carried mostly by this pointing, uh, pointing flux. Um, and so we can uh, write a very useful expression here that the, um, the flux uh, through some, or let's say this is the flux. Um, so this is an area, this is an energy density, and this is a speed, so that's power. Um, and it, we assume that the magnetic flux is carrying some fraction of the spin down luminosity. So this is the available magnetic, uh, magnetic energy. Um, Okay, um, so we can rearrange this equation because we know the magnetic energy density is just v squared over, over 8 pi. I can rearrange this, um, just write an expression for br, um, which uh, just takes this simple form here, and then we return to our old friend, the Hillis limit. Okay, so the Hillis limit um, has this factor br here, and so I just substitute this in, and I see that I get a maximum energy which doesn't depend on anything other than the um, spin down luminosity because the wind is relativistic, so beta is unity. Okay, so the maximum energy that I can get um, is about 2.5 PV um, if spin down, if, if I have 100% efficiency and the spin down is, is over, well, let's say, if the efficiency times the spin down is 10 to the 36 ergs per second. And for reference, the crab is if you 10 to the 38 ergs per second. Okay, so this is easily achievable for the crab. But this is a theoretical maximum. It doesn't take into account losses, okay? And so if you take into account losses, then I know, remember, that the maximum energy times B over B crit, so this is the cooling time equals to the gyro time, um, is basically one over the fine structure constant. Um, and if I plug in, again, the value for B here, now the, the size is important again. Um, but so the maximum energy that I could get at the shock is about 10, um, this is the, we know that the crab termination shock is at about 0.1 parsec. Um, and uh, again, using this, this uh, efficiency, um, get about 10 PeV, okay? So clearly the crab is, is, um, is, is quite efficient, okay? We need this number to be large. Um, and the thing that I wanted to, to just impress upon you is that while the crab is a very powerful pulsar, it's by no means unique. We have lots of powerful pulsars in the galaxy, um, and these pulsars are almost all containing relativistic shocks and oblique, okay? So the same process that's happening in the crab should be happening in other pulsars. Okay, um, and so then this brings us 
full circle. Um, yep, very quick. Um, so we bring this full circle to um, our, uh, our what we've heard a lot this week um, so far is this exciting lasso results. So here are all the, uh, in part of the sky, all the sources above 100 TeV. And so the question is, how many of these could be, um, could be pulsars? We know the crab certainly accelerates above 100 TeV. Um, so how many of these are the same? Okay, um, as, as Alicia referred to yesterday, these sources are extended. Um, they're difficult to resolve. Or the point short function of lasso, or it, it's, its resolution, um, and so it is highly ambiguous. But most, many of these are associated. There is within this this region um, a very high power pulsar. Um, in fact, several of them were already detected by by Hawk, um, and I, because we we looked at this in quite a bit, um, I'm going to mention just the three. So that's 1825, which is there somewhere. 1907, which is uh, there. They call 1908, slightly off, and then 2019 is off, a different part of the sky. Um, so can these be pulsars? Um, and the thing to highlight here is the crab is quite steep and these spectra are actually quite hard. And so if we were in the case where you were magnetically dominated, which is probably the case in the crab, um, then this is hard. But um, there are situations in which the photon energy density could be larger than the magnetic energy density. And as we showed, this can give you quite hard spectra. Um, but you have to play a few games. You have to be a little bit careful, right? Because we know how extended these sources are, certainly in the case of Hawk, which is a better, better resolution. Um, and so these are more or less the size of the sources. We know that they should satisfy the Hillis limit in some sense constrains the size. And so here, as the magnetic field goes, goes up, I'm safer within this constraints. I need to be above this line. Uh, these are absorption. I can't have uh, very strong photon fields over a too large a volume or I absorb all my gamma rays, I wouldn't see anything. Um, and so you, this kind of limits the parameter space. And you run into a little bit of a problem is that to get to high energies, I need a high magnetic field. And then it gets hard to get a large photon energy density, right? So to get this to be a large number, to get high, uh, hard, ultra high energy gamma ray spectra. Um, and so what we, or one thing that we considered was the fact that in, for example, the crab, the field is falling off very rapidly downstream. So you can accelerate in a region where there's very high fields, like in the crab, um, and then you very quickly uh, diffuse away uh, into, into a region where there's very weak magnetic fields um, and, and very high photon energy density. So these nebulas are very bright. Um, and so if we play that game again using, uh, this is just using Gamera. Um, so we had some assumption on the injection of the spectrum, so something like eight to minus two, using quite reasonable parameters on, on these ratios, um, we were able to produce, so the, the, these solid lines are, are the butterf or boxes are, are the butterflies, so basically the data, um, and then we can get curves going through these, uh, at least through the high energy part, quite reasonably for various reasonable assumptions on the parameters. Okay, um, and so while we've seen all these new sources, we haven't seen the spectra yet. So I think there's a lot of work that's going to appear and hopefully give us new insight and hopefully proves us wrong, yeah? Because then it'll be really interesting. Um, because if we want to get hard spectra and, and uh, we can't rely on, on these techniques, we need very unreasonable parameters, then it means that something really interesting is happening. Okay, so I hope I'm wrong. Okay, um, so I'm pretty much done. So here's all the things I didn't cover. Um, so as you can see, there's many, many fields where non-thermal emission is, is, is essential to understand. Um, gamma ray bursts, magnetars, I don't even list them all. I didn't even mention microquasars or microblazars. Um, dark sources, many dark sources, we don't know what they are at all. ultra high cosmic ray production is clearly key for all of this. Um, non-thermal dark matter signatures um, from, from uh, decay products, many, many things. So the, the non-thermal universe is very vast and I can't cover them all in two lectures. Maybe like Irene in four lectures. Um, all right, so just to summarize, um, I think that hope I've convinced you that there's a lot of non-thermal processes in play. I hope you've all learned something and have been able to take away something on these processes or at least a bit more enlightened on them if you hadn't heard them before. Um, Again, we always require, as theorists, we're always requiring new models uh, to develop our ideas, test our ideas, um, and develop new, new theories. Um, and so, mentioned I have this love-hate relationship. I showed you how single-zone models um, 
how to how to construct them. They're a good place to start, but they're definitely a bad place to stop, right? They don't really give you any um, anything other than ballpark physics insights. So it's not physical modeling. It's really just to get a feel for what's going on. Um, it is important to understand the limitations and subtleties of all of these processes, as I try to, to impress upon you. Um, and I think this is my biased summary. Uh, shock acceleration is still the best developed theory. And this, of course, leads it to the most attacks and why people who want to do something new do other things. Um, but again, um, it doesn't explain all observations. So we need people to have new ideas um, and bring new, new information to the table. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Very good talk. Questions? Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, it's actually not a question, it's more a comment it's about the reconnection, uh, magnetic reconnection mechanisms. It's, in fact, it's not true that the magnetic reconnection plays a, a role just only in the um, uh, resistive scales. We have, for example, in the presence of turbulence, we have the Lazarian Vishniak model for magnetic reconnection, that we have a huge, uh, a large scale, uh, coherent magnetic field like a sweet Parker. Uh, configuration, but the wandering of the magnetic field lines uh, may produce the several reconnection patches, uh, reconnection sites, and this makes, for example, the uh, the reconnection rate independent of the ohmic resistivity, and this makes the reconnection magnetic reconnection rate fast. Uh, uh, other uh, another thing is that uh, the shock acceleration is still the best developed theory, but it's not, uh, in fact, when we have the turbulent magnetic reconnection, we, uh, we can have the particles accelerated in the, for example, in the surroundings of black holes, in the jets, or in the accretion flows, uh, as well as the, the shock according to a first order Fermi uh, process. Uh, this was uh, shown by Diego Veda Alpino and Lazari in 2005. Uh, so uh, I, I think you're biased by the, the shock acceleration, but uh, in the case of uh, turbulent reconnection, we can have another powerful mechanism to accelerate particles in these in this regimes. Just, just a comment. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. So I mean, I did, I did say that I was just giving the Sweet Parker picture, which is again a very simple picture, and in fact, Parker was always thinking that it was going to be turbulent. He, I've heard him say that. Um, so there are other things. I know, and I agree that turbulent reconnection is, I think, is, is the natural solution to, I mean, I think reconnection is a key part of turbulence. I think this is very clear for any collisionless system. Um, how much it really impacts the very highest energies, again, I'm perfectly, I know that if you, if you allow for the fact, I mean, it's basically a second order Fermi process because you allow for particles interacting with electric fields that are somewhat more chaotic and you can get up to higher energies and you can be very fast. And I know that it can be actually surprisingly fast when you allow for these. Um, but I would still say that the field is not so well developed to the point where you can have a very simple prescription of here's what the power law is. Here's what the radiative signatures are of it. And I hope uh, clearly you're biased too, with your own your own biases. So I agree, it's a very fascinating. And I think a anyone who's ignoring turbulence um, is is of course missing a trick. But one thing that I always, whenever I talk to Alex, um, uh, you get the same questions of like, have you considered turbulence? And you say, yes, yes, you have. I have. But I'm when I'm talking about shock acceleration, you're very often talking about uh, physical environments where the tail is wagging the dog. It's not ideal incompressible MHD or even compressible MHD, right? The, the dominant player here is this whopping relativistic rigid currents um, associated carried by the cosmic rays, right? So a lot of the conclusions can change and this is really, I mean, I think we're really only at, at, at the beginning of the baby steps from this compared to shock acceleration, yeah, which, which has this nice solid framework and now we're looking at the corrections to it. I don't think there'll be some major shift in the theory um, in the foreseeable future anyway. So thank you so much for a very wonderful lecture on the particle acceleration and the radiation mechanism. So can you please go to the slide where you have mentioned about the Monte uh, the hard simulation where the Lorentz factor is varying with the time? <laughs> 
Can you please go back to the slide? Oh, all the way back at the beginning. Yeah. I'll do it this way. Yeah, sorry for that. This one. Yeah, so I just want to uh, the oh. previous one. Not uh, too many cartoons. Ah, yeah. So I just want to know, uh, does this uh, uh, the shock process occur in the relativistic jets of the Aegeans and Blazers? If yes, then my question is that, uh, you showed the Lorentz factor is uh, varying with the time. So now we know the Doppler factor is the uh, fun. Uh, 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 this is particle Lorentz factor, not shock Lorentz factor. Okay, like so. So, so okay. the this shock is pretty steady. The Lorentz factor, the shock is not changing. Okay, so uh, you showed the uh, Lorentz factor is varying with the time, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, does this occur in the relativistic jets of the Blazers Aegeans? I would argue yes. Okay, so now my question is that, um, so Doppler factor is the uh, function of the Lorentz factor and the, a, cosine, a cosine function where the angle is between the line of sight and the jet axis. Mm -hmm. So uh, by changing the Lorentz factor, how does this affect the variation in the time series data? Now, this is my first question. The, now my second question is that, if we consider the relativistic jet have some curvature, right? So the combined effect, how uh, how this combined effect uh, uh, like uh, uh, create some complexity in the variation in the time series data and how to distinguish uh, which process is dominating over what? Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there. Okay, first thing is here, again, these are individual particles. These are the particles that were producing the radiation. So they, they you're talking about bulk Lorentz factor, so you're really thinking of particles are embedded in a, a volume and, and then they're boosted towards you collectively. So everything you would see, everything that I showed from these single zone models would be done in a frame which is now uh, moving relative to the observer. Um, if it's a highly relativistic, of course, that means that you would probably only see the bits that are moving directly towards you. And so then your question is, how does curvature, all of these things affect? They probably produce a huge amount of variability and probably can account for a lot of the variability that's seen in, in blazars. So you're really just seeing the patches where they're they're moving towards you. So this is sort of like you can think of it like mini jets. So there's lots of jets within the jet. Um, this is one of the, the the models that goes for for understanding blazar variability. 